So ladies and gentlemen, in this section we are going to talk about Anderson's fault theory and, and the conjugation of faults. So we have used the term conjugated faults quite a lot. Uh, here we want to define it and explain it in more detail what conjugation of faults actually means in uh, a genetic context. Let's start with a few observations that are commonly made in the field. The first would be Normal faults very often in the field have a dip angle of about 60 degrees. Thrust faults are usually shallow with dip angles at about 30 degrees. And strike slip faults are very often vertical or near vertical. So why is that so? For this purpose let's have a look at this diagram and these tables that we have seen before. And when you have a look at specific planes, the vertical plane and the horizontal plane in a stress field where the larger stress vector would be uh, say here vertical and the smallest horizontal you will observe that onto these planes there is a zero shear stress acting we see that here and here and here and here in these tables which corresponds to these two planes and all stresses that do act on these planes are normal stresses Hence we can conclude that planes normal to principal stress directions are planes of zero shear stress. Now Anderson's fault theory postulates that the Earth's surface must be a plane of zero shear stress which would be compatible with the observations of fault orientations that we just have discussed. Uh, that means if the Earth's surface is a plane of zero shear stress, which is plausible, one of the principal stress directions must always be vertical and the other two must be horizontal. Now let's combine that with the Coulomb failure criterion for brittle failure with internal angle of frictions of about 30 degrees, which applies on average to most common uh, rocks of the Earth's crust. If we now place sigma 1 into a vertical direction, we would uh, see a situation like here. Sigma 1 is vertical, sigma 3 is horizontal, sigma 2 is perpendicular to the 2 and also horizontal. We would produce normal faults dipping at 60 degrees, uh, which means at an angle of 30 degrees with respect to sigma 1. We see that here. Obviously also here to the conjugated fault on the other side there would be a 30 degrees angle. If we place sigma 3 vertical, we would form thrust faults dipping at 30 degrees because the largest principal stress vector now is acting horizontally and sigma 2 again is perpendicular to it. We see in the thrust faults, in these conjugated thrust faults dipping at 30 degrees that uh, we have again a, a conjugated system that is 30 degrees with respect to the surface. We also see that like with the normal faults that we have looked at before, sigma 2 is at the intersection plane of the two conjugated faults. That is the case here, that is the case here. It is also the case when we place sigma 2 vertical. A vertical sigma 2 would cause strike slip falls dipping at 90 degrees and again we would observe a 30 degrees angle between sigma 1 and either of these conjugated faults. Again the intersection line of the conjugated faults would be sigma 2. It's not shown here but it is vertical. It appears there is a strict geometrical relationship between the stress field and the faults. And however we would rotate a stress field, we would rotate also systematically the faults. Let's look at this example here, normal faults, sigma 1 is vertical. If the stress field tilts, then accordingly also the fault orientations would change. And we see here we can rotate that same block further and further until eventually uh, reaches an orientation where sigma 2 is vertical and then exactly these faults that would here in a normal fault orientation here in oblique slip fault orientations would here be in strike slip fault orientations. Hence the stress field 
would control the orientation and the slip nature of falls uh, as a primary factor. We will later see that there are some limitations to this, but in principle that is how the relationship uh, might be and that applies to rocks that do not have pre-existing fractures and that form strictly in a Coulomb failure environment. We also can rotate these uh, blocks into a different direction. Let's see here. Let's rotate the stress field and now we end up with uh, faults that would be thrust faults because we have rotated the block and the stress field in such a way that sigma 1 now would be horizontal and a sigma 1 and a horizontal sigma 1 we have seen that produces conjugated thrust faults. So this is an important piece of information that the geometrical relationship between faults and the stress field given that the internal angle of friction is 30 degrees uh, is always as shown here. Sigma 1 and the conjugated thrust faults, both of them are related by a 30 degrees angle and uh, at the same time we could say sigma 3 and the faults are related by a 60 degrees angle. And we also observe that uh, sigma 2 is oriented along the intersection line of these conjugated faults in all three cases. So now here we see uh, the three main cases, normal faults, thrust and strike slip faults with their vertical sigma 1 or sigma 3 or sigma 2 uh, in their relationship with uh, the stress field and with these 30 degrees. Let's assume the uh, internal angle of friction is about 30 degrees which would produce these theta angles to be 30 degrees between sigma 1 and either of these two uh, conjugated faults. Uh, at the same time we could say uh, there is a systematic relationship between sigma 3 and these faults, uh, an angular relationship of obviously 60 degrees in both cases and uh, we would see that sigma 2 is always placed along the intersection line of these conjugated faults. That means sigma 2 is the only stress vector that actually lies on both of these faults. Let's examine a little bit longer the relationship of conjugated faults to each other and to the stress field. Here we see a, a block diagram with various typical fracture orientations. We see here for instance the mode 1 fractures that form under low confining stresses parallel to sigma 1 and perpendicular to sigma 3. And we also see here the Coulomb faults that form at an angle of 30 degrees with respect to sigma 1. And here we see one of these conjugated Coulomb faults. And uh, let's look at the geometrical relationship of the Slicken lines that would form on such a normal fault. Sigma 1 is vertical. And we can see that the Slicken lines are on a plane that also connects sigma 3 and sigma 1. This is an imaginary plane uh, but it illustrates the geometrical relationship between the transport direction, the Slicken line on the fault and the stress vectors. So it is not only that the strike of the fault is perpendicular to uh, sigma 1 and sigma 3 plane, it is also that the Slicken line itself has, an, has a clear geometrical relationship to the stress field. The trend of the Slicken line, we see that here, is the same like the trend of the sigma 3 stress vector. And that is quite useful to know if you are dealing with a Coulomb fault and Anderson's fault theory applies. You can determine the uh, trend of sigma 3 when you determine the trend of the Slicken line. You also see here that the trend of sigma 2 is perpendicular to the Slicken line. Now let's add the conjugated fault. The conjugated fault is here shown as a trace and I have added it here as a planar surface uh, and also that one would have a Slicken line and we can see when we form a, an imaginary plane that goes through sigma 1 and through sigma 2. We produce a mirror plane for the conjugated fault structures. So here uh, this fault dips uh, away from us as the uh, other conjugated fault dips towards us 
and this sigma 1, sigma 2 plane forms the mirror, mirror plane for these two. Then let's add uh, what we have seen before. We have seen before that here this orange plane through sigma 1 and sigma 3 uh, also matches the orientation of the Slicken line on the one conjugated fold. Uh, we see here uh, this also applies to the other conjugated fold because of the mirror effect that we just have discussed. And uh, let's add that here on the one surface we have a uh, transport direction top to the right and on the conjugated surface we have a top to the left transport. That is also characteristic for conjugated faults. So let's summarize here. Conjugation of faults means that uh, two sets of faults are forming at the same time. They form uh, controlled by the same stress field uh, but they have different orientation. This orientation is uh, mirrored over a plane formed by sigma 1 and sigma 2. The Slicken lines on conjugated faults uh, lies for both faults on a plane that is formed by sigma 3 and sigma 1. And the transport direction on conjugated faults is opposite to each other. That means here we see in this normal fault system a, a top to the right and a top to the left transport, which could be, say, in the field a top north and a top south on these conjugated pairs or in a strike-slip fault if we turn this block around so that sigma 2 is uh, vertical then we would have one sinistral and one dextral strike-slip fault in a conjugated system. If you find a situation where you have an intersection of say two dextral faults then these are automatically not conjugated faults. They cannot have formed by the same stress field. They are faults of different generation formed at uh, different orientation with respect to the stress field and, uh, and, and so they are not genetically re related to each other. So the mere intersection of structures or fault structures uh, or shear fractures does not postulate, does not indicate conjugation. You need to accumulate quite a lot of geometrical evidence uh, in order to associate two intersecting fault structures as a conjugated pair. And the opposite shear sense is one of them. The interface angle between them of uh, 60 degrees, which means 2 times 30 degrees from sigma 1 to each of them, is another criterion. But also the orientation of Slicken lines needs to be compatible in the stress field sigma 1, 2 and sigma 3. Here on this diagram we, we relate the structures and the causing stress field to the strain ellipsoid and we see here in this situation if we form uh, Graben-like structures with conjugated normal faults then obviously the maximum shortening direction would be vertical, the uh, maximum stretching direction would be horizontal and also in the intermediate one would be, uh, would be horizontal. The strain ellipsoid would here have its longest axis in a horizontal and the shortest axis in a vertical direction and this is just the other way around compared to the stress ellipsoid. Here the stress ellipsoid shows the maximum principal stress vertical and the minimum principal stress horizontal. In this situation here we shorten vertically and we stretch horizontally uh, the uh, dimension along S2 remains the same so in this case we would look at a plane strain strain ellipsoid. You might want to revisit Flynn's diagram and relate now this stress ellipse to uh, the strain ellipse and this strain ellipse to the Flynn diagram. What's about reverse faults? We know about reverse faults that they have uh, thrust kinematics that means the hanging wall block moves over the foot wall block but that they are steeper than 45 degrees and often they are dipping around 60 degrees. So they have the orientation of normal faults but they have the kinematics of thrust faults and this is not compatible with Anderson's fault theory. Anderson's fault theory clearly does not cover reverse faults. So how do we explain reverse faults? And there are, there are three principal uh, ways to explain that. First, reverse faults 
could be reactivated normal faults. That means first you have a extensional kinematic event that forms normal faults. Later, uh, the crust is uh, undergoing ho uh, horizontal shortening, and that might make use of these former normal faults and reactivate them as reverse faults with a thrust kinematic, and uh, we call that inverted Graben structures. The next way of uh, getting steep, steeply oriented uh, faults with a kind of a thrust kinematic might be passive tilting into that reverse fault orientation. These faults could have formed as any other fault type and later were just brought by block rotation, by passive block rotation into the orientation that we observe today. And uh, the third possibility would be that uh, the stress ellipsoid simply was inclined. The stress ellipsoid was in an orientation that uh, is not predicted by Anderson's fault theory. Also that might happen in more complex orogenic situations. We also know that there are not only either dip slip or strike slip faults, and these are the fault types that we have discussed in this chapter so far. Uh, oblique slip faults might also be explained by these second two points that we have seen. Either they have formed as dip slip or strike slip faults and later were passively rotated, or again the stress ellipsoid might not be in an orientation that uh, very often is the case that uh, is explained by Anderson's fault theory, uh, but simply that might not always be the case and uh, this would then obviously lead to uh, oblique slip faults. As soon as uh, no principal stress vector is vertical, automatically oblique slip faults would form. So we have a number of limitations of Anderson's fault theory. First it applies only to faults that do not utilize pre-existing surfaces for faulting and these pre-existing surfaces might uh, well not be oriented at 30 degrees to the prevalent sigma 1. Uh, we should exclude passive rotation of the faults after they have formed, perhaps in Anderson orientation, and in order to evaluate that we should look for younger structures that might actually have caused this passive fault rotation. So and last not least, um, the third point is that if we want to do some more thorough paleo stress analysis, that means analyzing the orientation of the stress field that has produced the faults that we are looking at, we should know at least approximately the internal angle of friction of the rock that, uh, that we are studying. We can get an idea of such a, uh, of this angle uh, just by looking at uh, tabulated values uh, from experiments. Similar rock types that will give us uh, probably more or less a 30 degrees angle. Uh, and we need to know that particularly in situations where we do not have conjugated faults, if there is a conjugated fault then obviously we can work out the internal angle of friction by just measuring the angle between the two faults. This will be content of third year practical assignments. Uh, in the next course we are going to look into um, paleo stress analysis uh, using graphical methods using the stereo net. Thank you very much.